Hello and welcome to the Health Wizard Podcast. I'm your host, Yelena Isoldi Medici, a health and life coach. I'm so excited that you're choosing to listen to my podcast because you are choosing to make your health your priority. The Health Wizard Podcast is dedicated to teaching natural, easy to implement practices that you can use to get your health on track and become the person you used to be before getting sick and the person you're dreaming of becoming again, happy, healthy, full of energy and living a life filled with joy. Now, very quickly, before we dive into the good stuff, I want to remind you that this podcast is intended for education and entertainment purposes only. This podcast is not a substitute for professional medical advice. If you have a medical condition, please seek the help of a licensed medical professional. I am not a medical doctor. I do not treat, diagnose, prescribe, or make claims outside of my areas of expertise. So by choosing to listen to the Health Wizard podcast, you take full responsibility for your own actions. And when you hear the testimonials of the people who were able to get well, realize that their outcomes depended on their effort and their specific situation. With that said, let's jump into today's episode. Please enjoy. Hello, ladies. This is Yelena Isoldi Medici. I'm so excited that you can join us today because I have a super special gift for you. It's a treat, really. I was in a meeting for... Uh, so my husband and I are working on writing a book about his life story and how he healed himself from trauma and from dysfunction and coming from a background that was very violent to becoming the man that he is today. And then in that meeting, I met Dr. Russell Kennedy. And I was like, oh my God, what do you do? And before you know it, the meeting was going on and we were chit-chatting with each other in the background. I was like, okay, we have to talk. The day after we talked and now we're here. The work that we do is very complementary. While I'm focusing on women's health when it comes to hormone imbalances, thyroid conditions, autoimmune conditions, and all of you have those conditions, you have experienced anxiety and depression and panic attacks and uh, the lack sometimes of emotional strength. Dr. Russell really... Uh, honed in on helping people to deal with anxiety and resolve it very effectively because he is not just book smart, he's street smart. He was a person who experienced anxiety on his own uh, skin in his own life. And he has multiple degrees. He has a degree in medicine. He has a degree in neuroscience and psychology, and he is a trained yogi and he's training so much. And he has a book that will be released in the summer of this year. It's called the anxiety RX, which I'm actually looking forward to reading because from what he told me, I was salivating. I said, the geek of me in, inside of me was coming out to play. So without further ado, we're going to bring Dr. Russell Kennedy on so he can say hello and then we're going to jump into today's topic. Hi, Russell. Hey, Elena. How are you doing? I'm excited. Remember when we met only a few days ago, I was like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And uh, my husband knows it just whenever I see something go like a, a hungry dog after a bone, I'm like, I need to have that guy on our broadcast. I need to do a podcast with him because I really found that what you have been through made you the person who you are, kind of like my life, my pain made me into who I am. So can you please, before we jump into today's topic, give us a little bit of who you are and how you ended up doing the work you're doing? Yeah, uh, my name is Russ Kennedy. I'm a medical doctor. I grew up in a family where my father was schizophrenic. So there wasn't a whole lot of stability. He was never violent or abusive, but there was a whole lot of instability and a lot of the energy in the household went to him. And, you know, when we were talking earlier, it's like, I think women are like that too. They're typically the caregivers. There was only two sons in the family. So I was the oldest boy. So I kind of took on this caregiving role for both of my parents, actually. And that's what, you know, made me into a doctor. It also made me grow up too soon. You know, I had to adopt a, like a parental role, which a lot of, especially women, more women than men, but uh, adopt a parental role. And it just, it created a lot of anxiety in me. And it created a lot of anxiety that got stored in my body because I believe that anxiety is actually a body issue more than a mind issue. It is a mind issue. Absolutely. I'm, I'm, I have a degree in neuroscience. So, um, but I think we're missing a lot of valuable treatment options when we just try and talk our way out of a feeling problem. 
So when we talked, it was like, great, this is exactly, you know, you love neuroscience, so do I. But I've also done psilocybin, LSD, ayahuasca, not to get high, but just to examine my own anxious mind from as many perspectives as I could. So I really came up with a brand new theory of what anxiety is. And that's what the Anxiety Rx is going to be all about. That's what the book is going to be all about. It's just, and I think it's going to probably turn the psychiatric and psychologic communities on their ear because it's, it goes pretty much against every sort of medication, talk therapy, dogma that there is out there. Cause it just, it just really doesn't work that well. You know, it really you, doesn't. you said something that caught my ear, <laughs> not my, my ear. When we spoke, you said you used to be a doctor who had to see, and by the way, Dr. Kennedy is from Canada. So they have their own way of doing medicine, but it's very close to the United States medicine. You were seeing a patient every, you know, for seven or so minutes and the tools that you were given for that amount of time was really a prescription pad. And you said it killed your intuition. I would love to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah. I mean, since I've been a child, I've always had this intuitive ability. So that's kind of what my superpower is. I can see into where people's trauma comes from and where they should direct their energies at focus on healing, as opposed to just sort of taking stabs at the dark and trying to find it out cognitively. Cause I think you really have to find it at a feeling level. So that's, so I would see patients and I would see where their issues were, you know, just almost at an intuitive level But I, you know, in seven to 10 minutes, I don't have time to go into someone's physical abuse or the fact that, you know, someone never felt good enough or they had an alcoholic mother who was drunk and they could never depend on her. Like I didn't have time to go into that. So eventually it burned me out because I really felt like I wanted to be able to do more. And within the confines of an allopathic medical degree, you know, really all you have is medication. Um, and we want to do, that's the thing about doctors is they want to do something, you know, they, they see a patient suffering. They say, Oh, the doctors are always giving out medications. And I mean, that's how we're trained. We're trained with the medications in mind. So my favorite saying when it comes to doctors is when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? (laughs) That's priceless. So so, well said, well said. I think that, um, I, so I believe in doctors when it comes to acute care, Dr. Kennedy, absolutely do. I think the Western medicine is one of the best in the world, but when it comes to chronic care, then you don't really need to hammer. You need to do something else probably. Well, yeah, I think the thing with chronic care is we go for what we know, right? So if someone's got a chronic like arthritic condition, so basically pain is what people come to see us about most of the time. So we do have medications for pain and people would rather, you know, not not to toss it back on a patient's, but people would rather take a medication than they would to go in and really dig down and and go back into those old traumas because they're really, and that's, you know, basically the healing of anxiety. People don't want to go back in there. And the reason why they develop the autoimmune disorder in the first place, a lot of times is they have this trauma stored in their body that was never resolved from childhood. And, you know, rather than fix it at its underlying root cause, you know, we cover it up with medications. And then, and then like we were talking about earlier, um, the the condition has to get louder and louder and louder because it has a message for you. You know, and basically the message is you have to connect with yourself. You've been, you've been treating other people. You've been putting other people first for so long. And this is especially true with women. You're putting other people first for so long that you lose the ability to even read your own body. I had lots of women and men too uh, with anxiety or stress who you know, didn't know when they had to go to the bathroom until it was absolutely urgent, didn't know they were hungry until they were absolutely starving. You know, So it's like we lose touch with our bodies because that's where the old trauma is held and we don't want to go back in there. So a lot I, of times- I, I want to pause here for a second because so I don't know how you process words and, and for me, words is like almost food that I eat. So when you say something as rich as you just said, I'm like, I just want to sit there. I'm salivating over it actually. And I want to chew on it because- At one point I thought, okay, I'm like the only crazy person because I made this hypothesis that most autoimmune conditions come from bad diet, but a lot of them even more come from broken relationships and it's broken relationship with environment, with yourself, with your caregivers and with your food. But a lot of them come come from the relationships that are broken between your caregivers and you or you and yourself, which really one creates the other. And I always looked for, uh, you know, where do I find studies for this? Where do I find evidence for this? And the more I meet people like you and I, the more I go, okay, I'm not a complete idiot to, to try to speculate on this. And I read a book recently, The Body Keeps the Score. We talked about it. And he, the same hypothesis that autoimmune conditions come from broken minds, from broken spirits. So to hear you say that, it just like, 
it's really more than music to my ears for us to understand if I have an autoimmune condition, it's not a forever disease because medical doctors are trained in medicine. They are trained in uh, surgery, but they're not trained to say, listen, that trauma from your childhood when you were molested is causing this autoimmune condition in you, but now you're too scared to go in. So let's just medicate you. They can't even make that connection, but most doctors will medicate people without knowing and which leads us to a land of nowhere because we don't even know to go and ask our bodies and our minds what's going on because you just said something beautiful. We are disconnected. It's not that that thing is beautiful, but what you said, we're disconnected from our bodies that sometimes we don't even know what makes us hungry. So we are either under eating or overeating and, and thus comes the uh, obesity and loathing yourself and so much more. Uh, talk to me how we do go looking for the emotions that are trapped in our bodies, because I want to focus on that today. We need to find out what they are before we can address them. So you've done your work. I do specific work with my clients. How do you approach that, Dr. Kennedy? Well, first, you know, I look at autoimmune diseases, like basically what it is, it's the body overreacting to yourself, right? And I think what it is, is it's, it's trying to get your attention. It's trying to say, hey, look at me, look at the child in me, look at the part of me that really needs fixing. So that's why your body's overreacting. It keeps going over the top because it's trying to get your attention. So it's kind of like a toddler throwing a tantrum. I was having a disagreement with my daughter earlier yeah. today. She spilled some coffee, um, not, co well, we have herbal coffee. She spills it on a cushion. We tell her to go and clean it. And she is being disobedient and I'm saying, do it. And so she throws this fit and she goes crying really, really loudly. Yeah. And the more I say, I want to get your attention, the louder she gets, because now she wants to get my attention in a way that is destructive for yeah. her because I'm like, I'm going to punish you. I'm going yeah. to take away your privileges. But in her sense, she thinks that the louder she gets, the more I will hear her. That's what you're saying. I think, and I think that's what happens in general. You know, we, we don't hear each other. You know, Stephen Covey said, we don't listen with the intent to, to hear mm. or understand. We listen with the intent to respond. So it's not like we're actually really listening to what the other person's saying. So mirroring is a great trick, you know. Uh, what's your daughter's name? Isabella. Isabella. Isabella, I can see you're really upset about this. I can see this is really, really bothering you. Because as soon as you, because all human beings really want us to be seen, heard, and loved. Yes. Right? So if you, if, if you say, this is my point, and this goes with your spouse, this goes with everyone. This is my point. And they say, well, this is my point. And it's like, well, all you're doing is you're getting, you're, you're not seeing and hearing each other. So you're not actually, you know, you don't really want to get the problem solved. You basically just want to get some energy out. And that's what happened, you know, and that's how, and whole relationships form on that. You know, I've got a, a friend, uh, a couple of friends we call the Bickersons, you know, this couple that, you know, I've known for many, many years and, you know, they, you know, go over for dinner, they have a couple of drinks and then they just start, they just, and it's just, it's almost like, it's almost like humorous. Because they will bicker about, you know, the salt was on this side of the table yesterday. It was supposed to be on this. It's like just ridiculous things because they don't want to actually solve a problem. They just want to dispel some energy and they want to blame each other. And that's the thing. We're getting a little off topic here, but I want to talk about blame for a second. It's like when you blame something, you discharge energy. But what happens when you blame yourself? There's no energy. So you discharge it for a second and then it comes right back to you. So, so when we blame energy. ourselves and that's you basically, what, yeah. And autoimmune disease is much like that. It just comes back. So it, it will, no matter what you do, it will, because until you get the message, it will keep ramping itself up louder and louder and louder. And most times, especially with women, it's that they've lost touch with themselves. They've lost touch with their bodies. The number of women that I, I saw with autoimmune disorders who were bedwetters as children, you know, so many, because it just, it's like you lose touch with your body. Well, let's, you let, let's yeah. pause here for a moment. I want to go deeper. There's so much to be had. I think we, we want to go just have a discourse over your entire book here. Since we are serving women today and the listeners are women, this is exactly what I find. So you're born into this world. And from the very first moment yesterday, I was doing an interview with Dr. Tracy Thomas. We talked about this, that from the very first moment we're popping out into this universe, we're told not to trust ourselves because somebody is going to tell us when to sleep, what to eat, you know, how to be, how to feel, how not to cry. So we immediately are taught not to trust our instincts. 
And when we are talking to women, women are conditioned to look a certain way, to be a certain way. You need to be a cook. You need to be good at this. You need to be good at that. By the time you get to the bottom of who we are, we don't know who we are. Yeah. Well, there's so, so much of, you know, and Dr. Jordan Peterson talks about this too. Women are much higher on the trait of agreeableness than men are. Mm -hmm. So they're much more likely to kind of flow with things, use their language to kind of see if they can kind of modify their environment, but they're much more likely to be agreeable. So if you tell, uh, you know, a girl for her whole life that she's supposed to be a certain way, she's going to internalize that a boy too, but women are just, they're just more agreeable genetically because they, they needed to be together to raise the children. So they had to get along with each other a little more. So it's just agreeableness is a trait that women have that, that works for them as far as communication. They're great communicators, but it works against them in that they, in that communication, they lose touch with what they need themselves. And they start getting really good at giving the other people what they need. And then the other people maybe might throw them a bone back about, oh, okay, well, and then, and then that's what they live on. They live on the odd bones that they get back from just agreeing with their spouse or their father or, or their mother, you know? So it winds up being this sort of operant conditioning, this, this sort of uh, uh, stimulus and response that over the course of many years, women and men too, but, but women lose touch with, with what they want. And, you know, when you're a child, you know, when you have a child, then everything goes into the child and it's just, it's, it's, it, it yeah. propagates itself. So uh, to make a point here and everything is kept anonymous, but I have a client um, the other day we were talking, I said, what is it that you want from life? And she said, you've been hounding me with that question from the very first day we met. And she said, she's been exploring it. We are a few weeks in and she said, I still don't know what I exactly want from life. And so the, the journey that we had taken was going to her early childhood. Mm -hmm. And this is exactly what we find. But what I, I find that you said is tremendous is that women are throwing a bone every now and then. And we are kind of like, yeah, we'll take it. So let, let's talk about uh, sex for a little bit, right? Okay. If um, women are in a sexual relationship, I, you know, statistically, a lot of women don't have orgasms during intercourse. Right. And they're like, I'm okay with that. At least we're close. I, I, when, whenever I my husband and I talk about it, I go, how many men would agree to having sex over and over again, but never orgasm? And he goes, none of us. Yeah. But we women, it just to go to the point that you're making, we are showing up for somebody else all of our life. Yes. But we have not learned to put ourselves in the center and say, not what about me, but it's about me. Like go focus right here. Yeah. And I, I think it's, it's on, and partly that's to do with, with, you know, women just sort of being able to take control and saying, you know, this is what I need in a non, you know, in a non um, aggressive way, you know, hear your husband, hear your partner, hear, you know, whatever your partner happens to be, you know, hear them and then say, you know, this is kind of what I need, or this is what I would like. And then hear them, hear what they say back. Because so often we go in there with a, a form of agenda, like you should be doing this for me. And you should also know telepathically what I want. And this is true for both. This isn't just true for women. This yeah, is but this, 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 this is the, you know, screwed up Cinderella story for ages that it has screwed up a little, a lot of little girls and boys that were supposed to magically know what our partner loves, but exactly. the conversation goes deeper, but I'm going to dial it back for a second. Again, where we are starting here is we can't sometimes tell our, our partners what we want, whether it comes to sex or relationship or our yeah. children. Um, we can't tell them what we want because we were never allowed to know what we want. Would right. you agree with that? Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's really the conundrum because it's, and your earlier client that you saw that said, you know, what do you want out of life? When you get this kind of, you know, decades long conditioning, you, that, that atrophy, if you don't use it, you lose it. And that atrophies over the course of time. And then you just start settling. And then I see so many women in their, you know, kind of late thirties, mid forties, just starting to settle. It's mm -hmm. like, okay, I guess this is, this is what it's like, you know? What is it? 25% of women between 40 and 60 are on some sort of, you know, psychiatric medication. You know, I don't mean to make it sound. How like did you say the first time we met, you said that between the ages of 30 and 50, that's when the wheels comes up. Uh, come well, up. yeah, I think, I think what happens now is that we, we're in the society now where I think everybody is starting to see, look, I really do have to, to pay attention to myself. I really do have to care for myself. 
And we're starting to see that. And, you know, part of it is the narcissistic culture that we're in, which is kind of a good byproduct of that. Because before, you know, women would get into their 50s and go, you know, the kids are gone. I don't really like this guy that much. Like, what am I doing here? You know, what, why have I devoted my entire life to this? And then just, but it's just really empowering yourself to, to really show that you do have control. And you don't have to sort of do it like the next day, but just start, you know, start making the intention every day when you get up or when you go to bed, you know, the great time to, to do this is five minutes before you go to bed is make the intention for the next day because your mind goes into this kind of semi-conscious, semi-unconscious state that's very receptive. What do you want for the next day? And, you know, it's like, I really want to be able to express my needs. And, but the more specific you can be, I really want to be able to express my need to my sister that um, this isn't working for me or, you know, or my mother or whatever. And the more you do that, the more your unconscious starts to, to, to take that in, the more likely you're going to do it because our programs don't come from our conscious mind. Our programs come from our unconscious programming and we just act them out. So if you can, if you can get in there and tweak those unconscious programs a little bit and five minutes before you go to bed is a great time to do it. It really helps like the next day, just automatically kind of doing it. I'll give you a quick example. I used to want to go to the gym a a lot and then the day would get away from me. I'd be in surgery or whatever. And uh, so what I used to do is this five minutes before I go to sleep, I would imagine myself packing my gym bag the next morning in in full detail. Like I could feel the socks. I could feel the, the shorts. I could feel everything going in. And then the next morning I just did it. I just automatically did it. And at the end of the day, I just automatically started driving to the gym. So it's like, if you leave it up to yourself, you know, you're going to get hijacked. It's like Mel Robbins in the five, four, three, two, one rule. You know, I don't know if you're familiar with that one, but it's basically, yes, I actually use that with some of my clients when it comes to indecisiveness. I'm like five, four, three, two, one. What do you want to do right now? Do it and do <laughs> it. And because, you know, if you wait, if you wait, um, You know, from a neuroscience point of view, anytime we wait, we're looking for danger and we'll find it. Like our brains are smart. We'll find any kind of danger. It's like, I don't want to go to the gym today. Oh, I've got to make dinner. You know, that means I got to get home at quarter to six. I don't really have time to get, you know, all this stuff starts going in. But if you just say five, four, three, two, one and do it. And I, you know, I, I try and do this, but you know, I'm not, I'm not as good as I'd like to, but it's helpful because we really do have to program our unconscious because we can't really depend on our conscious because our conscious is really an accumulation of all those old programs, especially for women. Um, and it, then- well, there's multiple. I actually have our clients do an exercise, uh, Russell, like this. Um, they come to us and, well, it's multiple. I'm going to pick one of them. And a lot of them, this programming runs so deep that they don't know who they are. They don't know what they want from life. They don't know why they're sick. And we start peeling away layer by layer. And one of the things that I have them do is write down the expectations that they have of themselves. Yeah. So make a list of everything that you think is expected of you. And we go through, make the whole list. And then we go through, uh, we have red pen yellow pen and green pen. Red pen is the expectations that have been put on me by society, Mm. my parents, school, church, synagogue, you know, you name it, that don't belong and they contradict my consciousness, but I do them because I'm expected and we cross them out in red. Then Mm. we go through and we say, okay, what are the, uh, some other expectations that have been put on me, but somebody else can handle those things. So we highlight them in yellow and we outsource them in only the things that are necessity and bring us joy. Do they stay? And through this exercise, I find that a lot of our women are able to go back, take their power and start breathing. Like, Oh my God, what do I want? This is the big question. What do I want? How do I get there? So really start tapping into that consciousness within that you, you call the unconscious mind, right? Yeah. It, it's that voice within you that tells you, there is something in you that you're born for, but as long as you're lost in everybody else's expectations, you can never tap into that. Yeah. And society has a tremendous pressure on women to, you know, accomplish so many different things that, you know, their own desires get pushed, pushed back. You know what? I think it's one of the uh, Eastern European countries where the youngest daughter is expected to, to uh, look after the parents when they get older. Mm-hmm. Right. So it is one of those things. And and that's that's a concrete example. But there's just so many societal examples, Um, you know, and and men are getting crushed, too. You know, it's a different way. It's a different thing. But but especially with women, because there are so many because you're so agreeable, you know, you're 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 malleable. You're you know, you're you you want to please. 
Right. We're predisposed to it. So why not maximize on what we're, we're predisposed for, right? Exactly. Exactly. But it's also a way, you know, to that agreeableness is also a way for women. Um, I don't want to use this term because it sounds too harsh, but manipulate. It's, it's a way of controlling, you know, it's like, okay, if this is what I have to do, I'm definitely going to use this to be able to control my environment. And then resentment start and, and, and so much unsaid in relationships, you know, with, with your spouse, with your kids, you know, it's just so much harder that way when you start putting layers on top of the onion and things get hidden and you, you get resentful, you know, like uh, what's that saying? Resentment is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. Yeah. Well, but that also allows more emotions then to get trapped in the body. So let's circle back to that. Um, You said that you found, so you, you used um, uh, it was LSD and other things to pinpoint because you carried anxiety since your childhood in your body but you were not clear what was triggering you, what was causing it. So you uh, use certain things to achieve the outcome that you want, but you found that anxiety lived in your body. Talk to me through the process of where and how you found it and how you dealt with it. Yeah. Well, back in, let's see, 2012, I was really burned out of medicine. I only had about another year left in me before I wound up quitting. And I was just, you know, I had tons of anxiety. I just, just, you know, I was really, worried all the time. I couldn't eat. I lost like 20 pounds. I ruptured my Achilles tendon. Like the whole world seemed to kind of crash in on me at once. And um, traditional therapies weren't helping. You know, I I went through psychiatric psychotherapy, EMDR, just, just about every possible therapy you could, you could name and nothing was really helping. So it was like, well, I'm going to have to figure this out for myself. So I had someone say, well, you should try this thing in India. So I went to India, I was one this university and spent uh, six weeks there. And uh, I learned a fair amount there about spirit and, and that kind of thing too. And I had a moment of enlightenment for about 90 minutes, I think, on top of a rooftop where I felt one with everything. And then I got back and I still hadn't much changed. So a friend of mine who's an Ayurvedic doctor introduced me and he said, look, you know, we can try you on some LSD and just kind of see what's happening. So on LSD, I'm shortening this down quite a bit. Uh, On LSD, basically, I saw that my anxiety was just my old traumas from childhood that were stored in my chest. And once I started addressing those, the thoughts started to go away. So basically, it was really connecting with that younger part of myself who watched his father like just crumble and eventually commit suicide. And, you know, I had to go back and talk with that you know, 12, 13 year old, I had to go connect with them. And a lot of people tell me, well, how do you, how do you connect with your younger selves? It's like, well, one is one way is I I find just kind of commiserating with them, you know, going back and saying, you know, it must've been really hard for you when you were bullied at school or when you were, you know, I just, just pick something in your past and go, you know, and talk to that, that part of you at that age Uh, must've been really hard when your, you know, your parents divorced. It must've been really hard when your brother got sick, you know, and just see what they say back, you know, and just, and just allow them to talk. Cause, cause when you can make that connection with them, that's half the battle is just making that connection with that younger self. Because part of us, we start to split, you know, when we, there's that great saying that's like, when, uh, when you abuse a child, they don't stop loving the parent. They stop loving themselves. Mm. That is so freaking deep. And it is absolutely true because we always want our nurturers to be the people we love. So we will make a reason why we love them and we'll grow up for them. We'll make up for them. But there is a part of us we start hating because we blame ourselves for it. But it's so beautiful that you brought it up because so my, my husband, I work in on his book that's going to be coming out also the end of the summer. And a part of his healing happened exactly in the same way. Because he was raised by abusers, people who actually violently abused his body, neglected him, tried to kill him. And by by taking himself into the past and meeting with that version of himself at that time, talking him to him, loving on him, allowing his voice to be heard when he would come back from, we call them time travels. So yeah. when he comes back from that session, he always felt like he grew up a little bit more and matured a little bit more and a little bit more pain and a little bit uh, of that we call it bondage sometimes that was released. So it feels like you were doing the same thing. So there's an actual tool that it does not require a medical degree where you can no. go and start healing yourself in the moment. 
And in fact, you know, medicine, you know, if I, if I told this to one of my, my medical colleagues, they'd have a seizure. Like they, it's just, it's so antithetical, you know? And the other thing about talking to that younger part of yourself is like, leave a lot of gaps in there. Like we're such a, a heads up society that we want to think about everything. It's like, well, let me, let me talk to this younger part of myself. And then, you know, we'll have a conversation. And I like leave lots of gaps. Like it's feel it's what we're doing is we're, we're moving the feeling around, not so much the, not the interpretation so much, not so much the thinking It's just getting into that old feeling of helplessness. Cause I remember, you know, just watching my dad go psychotic or manic or whatever, just the helplessness of it. And just be, and then I pushed that helplessness away so I wouldn't feel it again, but I never got a chance to metabolize it because I just kept, every time it came up, I would just push it away. So but you now, can only push it down for so long because eventually it has to erupt and for you it came as anxiety. And, and that's exactly how it showed up. Yeah. So, so it is one of those things where you kind of just sort of sit with it and, and just, and, and treat it with love and kindness. Like one of the things that my, my wife is a somatic experiencing practitioner, Dr. Peter Levine has a, a therapy called somatic experiencing. And basically you use the body to heal the mind. And I think that's where we're going. I think in the, in psychiatry, they're going to start using psychedelics. They're already using ketamine. Um, and they're using psych, uh, that and they're going to start using somatic therapies, you know, like, where do you feel that in the body? And earlier on, you said, you know, you said, how do we, how do we get in touch with this? It's like, well, find where, where it is in your body. For me, this sense is in my solar plexus, right? Where my, right, my ribs meet, but almost always, you know, if you think of something that's really, really traumatized you as a child, you know, abuse, abandonment, neglect, um, that kind of stuff and find it in your body, you know, really like just take a moment and find it in your body. Usually it's between your chin and your pubic bone, almost always in the midline somewhere. Most of the time it's around your heart, but not always. I've seen people have it in the lower part of their gut, the uh, pubic bone, throat, that kind of thing. And then that, that may well be your younger self, you know, that just got halted there. It's because there is amazing. A uh, one of the things that I actually do as a physical tool with our clients is I have them feel their emotions in their body. We go out searching. Yeah. I'll, I tell them, close your eyes and, and tell me where it feels in your body. And we scan the body to find out where it is. And then we start asking questions. Here's an interesting tidbit. And I, I think we'll probably agree in this one as well. A lot of times when I have somebody with thyroid issues, without a fail, what we find is people who were trained not to speak their mind and they yeah. hold their truth back. And it gets to this point, like, I want to say it, but I don't, it gets stuck. It gets st stuck in this, your throat plexus uh, energy center. And you go, can't say it because I'll be punished. Right. Or yeah. I will be rejected or I'll be refused or somebody who's going to yeah. excommunicate me. So you hold that. And somewhere, somehow the thyroid disease, it's one of the factors, not the factor, but it's yeah. a very prevalent uh, condition that I found with people who have hyper hypothyroidism, Hashimoto's or Graves is something gets stuck right here. And until you start releasing this, this is who I am. This is what I want from life. You're stuck. Medication can take you only so far. Absolutely. Cause I used to, what I always see with people is that, uh, and what I would ask people with thyroid is who are you not saying, what are you not saying to someone? What are you not? So, you know, in Ayurveda, this is the fifth chakra. This is fifth chakra. So fifth chakra issues are in the throat. They're basically inability to express emotion, inability to express anger specifically. You know, if anger wasn't okay in your family to express, a lot of people will start showing up with fifth chakra issues, which is thyroid is definitely in there as well. So it is one of those things. And I know as a medical doctor, you know, like I studied yoga and meditation. So I, I'm quite familiar with the chakras and, and my framework is more scientific, but I, I do definitely... I accept the chakras have their energy centers and they have, different you know, it's, it's funny that I see you do it. And I do it all the time when I speak to the Western uh, yeah. se sector of, of, of my uh, clients is I always have to pat it. Like this is scientific. This, yeah. I think that one day soon, we're not going to have to make excuses and apologize. We're going to merge them because there will be one science as opposed to Western uh, versus Eastern, because we know that chakras are there. We call them energy centers. And we know it's a real thing and we can measure the frequency at which they vibrate and how it works. So it's amazing that we still have to almost like apologetically say we believe in both. Yeah. But I, I think when they were merging, but I, I apologize. I just, I no, saw that in you, I saw that in me, I saw that in others. We're almost like, we need yeah. to be a little apologetics here so you all can get on the same space and the same ship as we're on. 
<laughs> and it is, you know, one, one of the things that I notice in my, on my trips with LSD and ayahuasca and that sort of stuff, because I do have a degree in neuroscience and medicine is that how similar these things are. They're just different language to explain them. Like really they're just, and, and the thing about medical doctors is they're very threatened by any type of therapy that isn't their own. Right. So, so chiropractic, I know you're going to get my friend Nima on here next week. I think Nima is a brilliant coach and, and just a brilliant kind of intuitive guy. He, he can kind of spot where your issues are. He's similar. That's why we get along so well. And it is one of those things where, where it is the same. It's just, you're using a different language to explain it. And medical doctors, you know, because there is such snake oil out there with some people and, there, and because we're living in this consumer driven society where everybody's trying to make money off everybody else, you know, there is this, there's this growing mistrust that we have of other people that is, is not warranted. It's basically, it, it, it's, a, it's a perceptual bias because of social media, because, you know, every five posts on social media, it's some guy telling me how I can make seven figures being a coach. You know, I almost screamed the other day. I barely go on social media, but right now, so as I'm checking us, how people are reacting, you know, what do we need to talk about? And sometimes I just want to scream at, at my phone, like, I don't want to get another program. I am done. I am yeah. okay. Like, can you stop yeah. pushing it? But it's non-stop. And, but we are programmed. We are programmed to trust and not to trust at the same time. Or, oh my God. So I, I do advertise. So when I advertise for even trainings that I do, free trainings, and people sometimes scroll through and this is what I heard. Oh my God, it sounds so fantastic. But now I'm too afraid to hope. Right. Yeah. And that's so true. Lena. That that's, you know, that, that kind of sends shivers up my spine because um, I think with people with anxiety, we've been trying to treat them for so long with this therapeutic model, you know, this like medication or talk therapy or whatever, and it's not working. So people are just getting so disillusioned and disappointed and exasperated um, that that's why I'm so glad that I'm able to sort of print this book and give people a different perspective. You know, you talked earlier on about consciousness and the words having consciousness. I don't even like the word anxiety because I don't think it carries that consciousness. And people, if you say I have anxiety, probably half the people won't even know what you're talking about because they've never experienced it. So I get people to say, look, I'm feeling alarmed today instead of oh, I'm feeling like anxious. that. My alarms are going out. They're getting exactly. my attention. Wouldn't we respond though differently if we use this different language? Because anxiety is very much, you have a diagnosis, you live with it, but an alarm is going off. It's kind of like a smoke alarm. You have to pay attention. Yeah. Well, yes, and you, you do and you don't. Because, but what typically people do is that they start making up worries. So here, if you have this energy stored in your body and it's not safe to go in your body anymore, what you do is you start creating worries in your mind to keep you oh in my your God. head. So I know I'm interrupting it on purpose and you might yeah. not do, do this to no, each other all that, the time. That's fine, Elena. I, fine. I want you to stop here so, so we can go deeper, actually. You said that I'm afraid to go into my body, please. Yeah. This is like almost, I'm, I beg you, I want you to go deeper, is why are we afraid to go into our bodies? Why is it not safe? Because when we were younger, here's my little, here's my little sort of schematic theory. So let's just say for sake of argument, when you're a child, your brain can hold a cup of trauma, right? So that's, you know, your pet dies, things, you know, someone gets sick and recovers and that kind of stuff. Now, say your parents get divorced, say a parent dies, say there's a huge trauma and you're, say you're abused, you know, there's only so much trauma that that brain can, can metabolize. So what happens is as soon as you pour that second cup of trauma in, it overflows and it has to go somewhere. So it gets repressed into the body because you can't function in your mind if you have all that trauma running around in your brain. So you push it down into your body, but you never want to go back and visit that again for the very same reason is it was too painful back then. And now you're, you're, you don't want to go back into your body. You don't want to revisit that pain. And there's, there's an, a, a structure in our brains called the amygdala, which basically is really responsible for fear and emotion, but mostly fear. And the amygdala has no sense of time. Mm -hmm. It has no sense of time whatsoever. So what happens is when you, when you feel that same alarm that you felt as a child, you will go back to that age. So, you know, I always say any overreaction, if you freak right out, you're in an age regression. You have gone back to five, six, seven years. Any overreaction is an age regression. So what happens is that we, we, we go back to that age at, you know, five, six, seven years old, where we experience this trauma, some younger, some older, 
And we don't want to go back there again because we feel like we're still seven years old and that we can't handle it. But they, it doesn't realize, the amygdala doesn't realize, look, I'm, I'm an adult now. I can handle this now. So that's what consciously you have to kind of start bringing in. And that's what I was saying earlier on about going back, talking to that younger version of yourself, saying, look, I'm here with you. I'm an adult now. I have all, a whole bunch of skills and talents that I did not have when, you know, I was getting beaten or I was getting abused, you know, or dad died or they, my parents divorced. I have a whole bunch more skills now. So you don't have to feel like you're still back there again, even though, so that's how you heal it is you go back there and then so you integrate beautiful. it again. So I hope that you have all of this in your book. I'm like a kid at it a is. Store oh, right yeah. now. Yeah, I'm like, is. I can't wait. I'll probably be walking over. So I, I'm very uh, much. I'll I send you a signed copy of it. Thank you. I, I express life through emotions. So for me, I'll be probably book in one hand, pacing around the house and screaming every two seconds. Oh my God. Yes. Yeah. So I, I, it's so beautifully said that for us to heal that child, yeah. that we need to come back to that meeting place as an adult saying, you are safe to come out. You're safe to be heard. You're, yeah. you're safe to express yourself. And um, one of the things that I love uh, telling my clients and I've done it myself is, Sometimes if you need to, to be heard, get in the car, drive away and have a screaming session, because yes. sometimes all you need to do is that, that reaction. So I believe that if we don't finish an emotion in our body, that it gets stuck and it's going to wait for us to complete it or it's going to break us down. So for example, if I feel frustrated and my parents tell me, don't cry, you don't have, you know, you're sissy for crying or something else, that yeah. emotion was never finished. So now it's staying in my body and it's going to express in violent behavior or something else. Or and until I go drive away somewhere and have this screaming session with myself and allow that emotion to run through my body, finish its work, I don't feel that we can actually heal. Yeah. And you and I talked about this the last time we talked when we weren't sort of online at the time, but it, it's like when you repress that, it gets pushed down so far that you start losing touch with it and you can't even get at it anymore because it's so deep and you don't even, re the thing is you don't even know that it's still there. You can feel the pain, you can feel the angst, but you don't know where to locate it. So it's, you know, it's really important to be able to find your alarm. And that's, you know, I have a whole sec second section of the book that is really involved in finding that sense of alarm in your body. Like, like I said, for me, it's in my solar plexus. It sits right here. And I have to get in touch with that when I go through my anxious phases, which I still do, and, and really pay attention to that and really sit with it and feel it. And, and the other thing that I was going to say, and I don't know if I said this yet, but take something that you love, you know, like a pet or, you know, a, a person, parent, grandparent, whatever, and then take your love for that person and then put that right over the spot where you feel the alarm. So just go back and forth between, okay, here's the alarm. Here's where I feel it. Now I'm going to take my love for my, say my dog Buddha, and I'm going to put that on top of it. So what that does is it creates a different pattern so that you're not always, whenever you're in the alarm, the alarm tends to replicate itself and it tends to make you feel alarmed and it pulls up your sympathetic nervous system. So you can't get out of it. So the, the cure for that is love. So the little analogy that I draw is like you're, there's, you have fear and love in a box and the more fear you have, the more love gets pushed out. The more love you put in the box, the more fear gets pushed out. So it's, it's really a matter of consciously really accessing the love in your life and really getting a felt sense of that feeling and then putting it on top of that alarm because really that's your child. So if you can love your child instead of pushing it away, which most of us do when we get, if we feel a negative emotion, we want to keep pushing it away. Like we were or, saying, or, or we eat it away. Don't we? Some of or, our women, can, uh, women men do too. Addiction, we drink yeah. it away. Yeah. We medicate. We, we shut it up. Basically the emotion is trying to come up and says, there's an alarm, pay attention. Yeah. And you go, Nope, give me the chips. Give me, you know, alcohol, give me something else because I'm too scared to go back into my body. Totally. That's exactly what it is. I'm too afraid to go back and visit that scared six-year-old. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to drink. I'm going to, you know, uh, for shop. I'm, there's going to be porn. There's going to be some sort of addiction that's going to take you away. And then what do you, if you have a child come up to you with their hands up, like, like I need some attention, I need some love. And then you decide you're going to distract away and do something else. That child is just going to get louder and louder and louder. And then they're going to give up. And then they're going to give up and then they're going to go into this wall of futility. And as soon as they give up, 
then they become very difficult to find. And that's what that's when things get stuffed down into our bodies. And that's when it makes it really hard to heal someone, because if you can't find the underlying problem, which is what you were saying at the start, when you say, I don't even know who I am, I don't even know what I want. It's been buried for so long that you get, and especially true with women, this few, that when we feel futility, we give up, we're like a, a cornered animal and, and we just basically just play dead. And, and neurophysiologically, we do that. Stephen Porges has something called the polyvagal theory. And basically, it's the, the oldest part of the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is the 10th cranial nerve, which, which is the most uh, powerful relaxation nerve in the body. But the ancient version of that, it, and it's in all mammals, basically shut us down when we were in severe, when we felt we were in severe danger. And what human beings do is that once we feel that our needs are being met over and over and over again, we just give up and we fall back into what's called the dorsal vagus. And that, that old, old vagus nerve just shuts us down. So we're susceptible to depression at that point and just giving up. And then when you Sadness, give up, you can't... depression, anxiety, absolutely. all, all of you... that comes as a part of giving up. Sadness yeah. is, is um, somebody, I asked a question on Facebook in one of my groups is one, what, what would be one symptom if you had to pick that you want to get rid of immediately? And a lot of women are responding with anxiety, sadness, and depression. Yeah, like it's a snowball. So they come from a place when our needs are not met and we feel like we're giving up on it. Yeah. And that's what happens. And, you know, Stephen Porges talks about this too. Like there's that dorsal vagal shutdown, which is this, you know, depression, you're, you're not moving anything. And then the next level up is sympathetic, the, the sympathetic activating nervous system of the body. So that's what in hyperthyroidism, basically it's trying to kick you out of that, that shutdown. So, so, and you can go one of two ways. So when the sympathetic nervous system, the fight or flight, typically what it's called nervous system reacts, it really wants to mobilize you towards pursuit and connection. But often what we, we misrepresent the fight or flight response and we, we perceive, perceive that it's fear. And then when we react out of fear, we just go, we redouble our efforts to stay away from the very part in our body that we need to connect from. So we get the activation and rather than turning that activation into connection to ourselves and other people, we turn it into pushing our, our own selves away and it just gets worse and worse and worse. And it becomes this cycle. Now where I want us to focus on now, we already touched on addressing it, how we can do it. Uh, one of the, I'm keeping an eye on Facebook right now. Sure. And Janine asked, she said, that the emotion that comes up. So for example, for you was anxiety. It was coming up over and over. You start addressing it. She said, does it ever go away or does it get smaller? And uh, she said that he said that he's, he still feels some. So some protection is present. They is necessary for survival or do we ever get rid of that altogether? You never get rid of it. I think, you know, and this is what Bessel van der Kolk talks about in, in The Body Keeps the Score is that book is that we're not, we're not teaching people to get rid of the negative feeling, the, the uncomfortable feeling. We're basically getting people to, to become more tolerant of it and not run away from it and not create a story around it. Because as soon as you create a story around this negative feeling that you have, it just reinstitutes re that whole thing. So when you have alarm in the body, the mind reads that and goes, hey, there must be some danger because we feel uncomfortable. And the mind makes up a story or a worry. And then as soon as we believe that worry, it creates more alarm back in the body, which creates more worry in our mind, which creates more alarm in the body. And we get caught in what I call the alarm anxiety cycle. And we're unaware of it. And the only way to break that cycle is to see your thoughts. So you don't have to be your thoughts anymore. Just see them like George Carlin, the comedian used to call thoughts brain droppings, hmm. which I thought was a brilliant term. Because that's what the brain does. It just keeps making thoughts over and over and over again. So it's a, it's a matter of just being able to see your thoughts and not be connected to them. And then the other part is being connected to that part of your body. So rather than getting sucked into worry, use that alarm to put your hand over that alarm, to connect with that alarm, to really breathe into it and really stay in the moment with it and, show, and, and become tolerant. Like, like I was saying, like in, in that book, The Body Keeps the Score, he's really teaching you to become tolerant of it because the more tolerant you can become, the more able that it doesn't trigger you into these negative thoughts anymore. 
And so we, we the, in a way we need to stop assigning meaning. So you, you absolutely you that, th- this is a beautiful beautiful tying yeah. together because it, it's also something I teach to my clients is when we keep creating that story, we keep creating the emotion over it. Yeah. The moment we're able to become a watchful observer as opposed to a judge and the executioner, we say I have an emotion. It's neither good or bad because we we are judgmental machines, right? From yeah. day one in this world, we are told this is bad, this is good, this is bad, this is good. So we immediately look at anyone or anything. We feel like we need to pass a judgment. But in my world, there is no good or bad emotion until I act on it, right? So if an emotion of anger comes back, I'm like, okay, why are you here? How do we need to complete you? I don't judge you. I'm not a worse person. What do we need to do in, in the opposite, right? So I don't believe that there is negative emotions. I believe that there are emotions that will alarm us. Right. And I believe that there are emotions that will help us heal faster, but both of them serve a purpose and a reason. So I don't want to say I want to be always anxiety free because a portion of anxiety is kind of saying, pay attention, pay attention. When if we allow it to finish its work, then it can step back and we say, okay, now I can live in joy again. But we don't want to be uh, like the fearless toddler, right? That will put the two fingers into an outlet and like, oh, do, do I see a fly? Right? Right. We don't want to be there, but we want to be aware enough to not judge it, coexist with it and keep that story as a story of who we are, but not determining our future. So our pain is making us into who we are today. To judge that pain is to judge ourselves. But if we say, I love you, I accept you, I'm letting you go, then it's a part of your history. But now you get to write a whole new script. Yeah. I mean, what, and, and that was great. I, I really, that's exactly how I feel about things. And, and I have this little process that I called ABC and, and it stands for awareness, body and, and connection. So when you feel a negative emotion, if you know, if you're upset with your daughter or she's upset with you or whatever, just be aware that, okay, this is what's happening. And rather than trying to think your way out of it, because when you're in an, in an emotional state, you, you can't think your way out of a feeling problem and you can't beat thoughts on their own turf. Like when you're, when you're in survival brain, you'll create all these survival type th- thoughts. And what you have to do is, is see that you're in it for one, and then just go right into your body. Basically, it's just go in a breath, go in a sensation, rub your fingertips together. So it's basically get in a sensation because sensation will bring you into the moment. And what happens with worries is that they transport you into the future. And there's no, there's no grounding in the future. There's only grounded in, there's only grounding in the present moment. So when you bring yourself in the sensation into your body, then you pull yourself out of survival brain. Then you get back into rational brain. Then you can go back to thoughts, but to try and think what in the heat of the moment, is basically just a, a, a recipe for a disaster. You, so you can't it, argue with your amygdala. When your amygdala is hijacked exactly. over, um, there's a book that I love. It's called Talking to Crazy. Love, yeah. love that book. And this is a part of it. It was written by um, hostage negotiator, very skilled guy. I can't remember his name now, the author. But that's what he's talking about. When your amygdala is hijacked, you can't reason with it. You have to get it to a place of safety first. Yeah. Exactly. And when that comes down, then you can deal with it. I got another question for you. Yep. Stephanie wants to know, she said, when we suppress our emotions for a long period of time, is this when bi- bipolarism or schizophrenia is possible to get created? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, depending on, you know, your inherent level of sensitivity, because a lot of us um, who have anxiety and schizophrenia and bipolar are very sensitive people. They're very sensitive to the energy of the earth. They're very sensitive. So, you know, it doesn't take much to push them out into a very survival brain state. And if you go into that survival brain state for a long period of time, your brain will adapt to that. And it will start creating what doctors will call bipolar or what doctors will call schizophrenia. So it really is all about connecting to yourself. And, you know, like I said earlier on, like commiserating, it must have been really hard. Like I say to myself, it must have been really hard for you when you were 12 and you're watching them take your dad over to the, the mental hospital. And then I just wait and I see what he says. And it's take, it's not like, you know, here's the thing. Uh, it, it takes a while to be able to talk to your younger self. You can try right away. And the analogy that I draw is it's kind of like a stone cutter. A stone cutter hits the stone 101 times and it breaks over, it breaks open the 101st time. Now it wasn't the 101st strike that opened it. It was the previous hundred to that. So it's just, it's just being consistent and going into it and, and going, being okay with emotion and then watch your mind, which is a compulsive meaning making machine to try and make meaning 
out of this feeling of your body. And on top of that, it doesn't want to go in your body. So it has to make meaning and it has to make it so painful that it keeps you in your head. That's why worries have to be so powerful is if you just worried, oh, I hope I don't, you know, forget to buy a bag of chips today. That's not going to do it. You know, you're going to have to, this is going to kill me because that's what's going to keep you in your head and away from this pain that you've been holding in your body. So that's why worries get so powerful is because they have to be. If they're not that strong, then you sort of run the risk of getting back into your body again. And you, you know, as a child swore unconsciously that you're never going to go back there again. But that's where you have to go. Basically, in a way, I will never let anybody hurt me like this again. I'll never feel this. I'll never become vulnerable because if I'm vulnerable, I will get hurt. So the promises that you're keeping to yourself in that sense. Yeah. And you have to feel it to heal it. That's the thing. But you need, you need support, you know, like depending on like people have got some severe abuse, abandonment, you know, alienation issues, you know, it's, it's not like you can just sort of sit there by yourself and, you know, meditate and Zen out. And this, this stuff's all going to go back to normal again. Sometimes we need another nervous system to ping off, you know? So that's what that, you know, I talk about that in the book. I mean, if you've got some severe trauma back there, have, you know, get a group together, get, you know, have this come out, get the shame out, get the blame out, get that stuff out. You heard. Because- yes. And this is why I'm a proponent of uh, coaches, mentors, somebody who can hear you without judgment, without sometimes even giving you too many tools, because sometimes all you need is to be heard and to feel yeah. safe to be heard. Uh, when I do a uh, consultation, sometimes with my clients, you think that I'm just like a, a, you know, a statue. I just sit there and I'm like, yeah, I hear you. I hear you. And amazing transformations happen right in the moment when people hear themselves speak and they're respected and they're not interrupted. Yeah, because everybody wants to be seen and heard. And the reason why they have such alarm in the first place is because when they were younger, they weren't seen and heard. They were they were valued for what they could do rather than who they were. Mm. Well, this leads me to another question that comes from in bar. She says, what do you do with people that walk away from you because you might have been sick and you have health issues and they push you away? Well, there's a bunch of, there's a bunch of different reasons for that. Sometimes people just can't handle it. They had a sick parent and they can't go back there again. Um, There's a bunch of reasons for that too. And then sometimes it's certainly an energy that we push out. I know I had, I I had a number of relationships with, I mean, I've been divorced twice, you know, so, so I've had a number of relationships with women over my lifetime. And I look back and I go, you know, the constant feature out of this, and I was never, you know, abusive or violent or anything like that, but I would check out, you know, I would check out and then they would get, some of them would get angry because I was checked out and I would blame it on them, you know, but it wasn't them at all. You know, you really have to, you know, people are mirrors, you know, they will mirror to you what energy that you are, are displaying to yourself. So if you're sick and you are judging yourself for being sick, if you put that out, that energy, the person you're with will probably judge you for being sick as well. Absolutely. So it's really, it's Absolutely. Really, it's yeah. one of the things that I always want to emphasize to people is if you don't love the way others are treating you, look at how you treat yourself. Yeah. Because your relationship with other people can be no greater than the relationship you have with yourself. So this is, this is a stop and think about it moment, ladies. So I want you to actually write this down. You can't expect your husband to be more in love with you than you're in love with you. You can't you're, expect your kids to worship you if you don't worship yourself. You can't expect to get a promotion on a job if you don't think you're worth it or deserve it or that you have to, you made the story that we have to fight for it or break the glass ceiling. I think that it comes from within us. If you believe that you're it, the whole world is going to treat you like you're it. And I was, I was talking to a, a client of mine the other day, Russell, and I said, sometimes I'm so in love with myself that I go, oh my God, I'm a goddess. I look amazing. Then I take a picture. I'm like, well, hold on. This is uh, lying because I see myself so much greater than this. And I think that we need to get to that point that we can't expect for others to love us the way we love ourselves. So we don't tolerate bad behavior. We've been trained, especially women, not to pay attention to yourself. Right. So this is this is the, the, the catch 22 that we're in. And and here's the thing, like so many of us are victims. You know, I've never met anyone who struggled with anxiety who wasn't a victim because what it does is it, it changes your physiology and you start looking and you start being on your heels all the time. And if, if your perception is that the world is out to get you, you're just going to start focusing on the things that are bad. And the more you focus on the things that are bad, the more that's going to be a self-fulfilling prophecy. One of the tenets of neuroscience is the more you focus on something, 
the more of that something you will get, whether or not that something actually changes in your environment or not, you'll just start seeing it more. So it's a matter of really, you know, when you're, when you're thinking about something, you're, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, I hope this doesn't happen. It's like, you know what, I'm going to actually consciously decide that I'm not going to be a victim to this anymore. I am not going to be a victim to this anymore. My mother, my mother is, you know, she suffers really badly with anxiety and she's, uh, you know, a world-class victim. And, and, you know, one day she, she doesn't live that far away from me. She only lives about 20, 25 minutes away from me. And her doctor's office is across the street. And she phoned me and it's, she said, Russell, I, I don't want to cross the street. Um, you know, can you come and get me? So I would have to drive literally, you know, 25 minutes, get her at her, at her the place where she lives drive her across the street, literally like 60 feet across the street, wait for her, drive her 60 feet back home. So it, it is one of these things where, where, you know, she, and I said, mom, you're not a victim. You tell yourself, I'm, I'm not going to stand for this. I'm not going to stand for, for my, my brain telling me I can't walk. I'm going to walk across that damn street. She hung out the phone. She got dressed. She walked across the street. She phoned me like an hour later and said, that was the best thing you could have ever told me. Because it, I think so. This, this is for some of you who have uh, this kind of mentality and you don't even know you're not going to love me after this. But I think sometimes we stay sick on purpose subconsciously so that we can have control over other people and how they love us, how they give us attention, how they see us. We sometimes that keeps us away from taking risks. Such, for example, if I'm healthy and happy and whole, uh, and I have a calling in my life. I need to go take risks. But how do I protect myself from taking risk and failing? I stay sick, then I don't have to, right? How do I take myself uh, from, for example, um, I had a client years and years ago. She got married. Her husband was in love with her. But the moment they get married, he's all into video games and she doesn't exist. Guess how she kept his attention? She gets sick. He is with her all the time going to appointments. The moment she's better, he's back to her thing and she's getting sicker again. So it was a yo-yo. So a lot of us unconsciously are milking this cow of being sick and we don't even know it, but I think that needs to come up to the surface. So for your mother, from what I'm seeing, she loves you being around her. She loves being waited on hand and foot. And I have an anxiety come on over. Boom. It just served her. Yeah. And it does. And, and, but it's just being really aware. Like, that's the thing. That's my thing about the ABCs, right? It's like aware, be aware of what you're doing and then go into your body and then, you know, you know, breath, you know, focus on the moment, focus on sensation, get yourself into the moment and then, you know, connect with yourself, connect with yourself. And at that point you can get out of survival brain and you can start really seeing it. Now, some people unfortunately are victimized by life. You know, there's, there's some severe conditions out there. And I used to see people in my practice, you know, and it's like, it's, it's hard not to see somebody who's, you know, you know, a quadriplegic or, or, you know, who, who, you know, isn't a victim because it's a victimizing experience. But the really, the thing is, it's really important to try and take the emotion out of it and try and just connect with yourself and say, you know, what could I do for myself right now that would make me feel more empowered? Yes. You know? And I think it's a choice. And um, I, I do agree with you. Life sometimes victimizes people, even though you make all the health efforts and you live the healthier lifestyle and still something happens to you. But even at that point, I think we can still make a choice of whether we agree to be victims or we've seen, we've seen people and, and they're going viral on YouTube and social media and everywhere. Uh, a person without legs is a motivational speaker or a person who can, does not see or cannot taste and they are achieving things or, or somebody who's severely handicapped is still an amazing parent. So we still see that we can choose to say, yes, I'm victimized or, but I will still rise above that. Yeah. And Kyle Cease talks about this too. So, you know, he, he talks about saying like, say something that you really, it really challenges you. And then after it say, and I love that say I'm being a victim right now. And I love that. I love that process. It's, um, uh, Byron Katie, she has the four questions, right? Yeah. That, that's where she does it. Yeah. And I love it. That's the, with her turnaround question. I have my clients do it. I am yeah. overweighed by, you know, a hundred pounds and I love it. They're like, no, I don't love it. I'm like, no, tell me why you love it. Yeah. So take, take me deeper into that. That's, that's, I haven't heard his name before. Well, you can't change anything that you don't accept, right? Like if you're shaming yourself for eating too much, or if you're shaming yourself for being overweight, you can't change anything that you shame yourself for. Brene Brown talks about this, you know, so you must fully accept and even embrace it in yourself before you can change it. And that's no more true than addictions to anything. 
So you have to really embrace it in yourself, which is again, not being a victim. But if you are being a victim, kind of go, okay, well, I'm having an hour where I'm going to be a victim. And then, but be aware of it, like be aware of your victimhood rather than just let it run you unconsciously. And the other thing I was going to say about that is a lot of children who got attention for being sick as children, because that's the only time they got attention for, 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 for being anything was when they were sick, their parents finally paid attention to them. That's a pattern you know, but it, but it's okay. Like the thing is just accept yourself. Like I'm being a victim right now and that's okay. Yeah. No judgment, no judgment. I always tell us. So when somebody works with me, we have them, for example, keep track of their food. So we know what they eat. And then we see like the telltale sign, you know, what they've eaten. And sometimes then they go, I'm so sorry, I messed up again. I, I always, the first thing that I ask is, have you enjoyed it? Like, did you enjoy it? Because for me, so you know, big secret, but I love savory foods and, and potato chips could be my weakness. So I don't let them in my house, right. but my wonderful husband brought them to me the other day. And I was like, okay, where's the plate? I'm yeah. going to go enjoy them. And then I'm not going to touch them for another year. But when I eat them and I know it's junk food, so don't judge me because I'm not judging myself. But when I eat them, I go there. Oh my God, it tastes so good because I accept myself for who I am. Therefore, I don't have to judge and if I don't judge, there is no guilt and there is no shame. And that means I don't have to spiral out of control anymore. Yeah, because shame is, there's a huge charge to shame. You know, the thing about shame is people really, some people have told me is like, it's when I feel really ashamed of myself, I feel almost the most alive, like the most charged. So there's, there's almost a conditioning to people to sort of pursue shame. Well, let, and let's talk about that because... Um, and I love uh, Joe Dispenza's work for this and Bruce Lipton. But what we do is when we have patterns like this, anxiety, shame, panic attacks, there are certain hormones that are released in our body, certain chemicals, right? The mixture is so powerful. It's like a drug and it actually goes to the, um, the pleasure center, right? The, the reward center, I should yeah. say. It yeah. goes to the same center where your pleasure hormones go and you're conditioned so much that if you don't stop consciously, subconsciously, you're going to look for the situations to create this emotion so that you can have this chemical expression. So you can go, okay, I got my drug for the day, shame for somebody's anxiety, for somebody is something else, but we do it to meet that addiction. Our bodies are addicted. They are addicted to certain emotions and, and we will find a way to get the next hit of our drug of choice. Absolutely. I remember my mother, uh, she used to work a lot of nights. She was a, a registered nurse and we only lived like 10 minutes away from the hospital. So she'd finish, uh, she'd do three to 11 and she'd finish at 11 and she'd be almost home always by, by like 10 after 11. And there was times where it was like, you know, nine minutes after she wasn't home, 11 minutes after 13. And I'm thinking, has she been in a car accident? Has she been killed? And then all of a sudden I'll hear her key in the door. And then I get this huge rush of like safety. So what was I doing just before I got that huge hit? Worrying. Mm -hmm. So worrying got to be an, like an operant conditioning, almost like a Pavlovian thing. Whereas when I worried and the thing that I did when I didn't, when it didn't come true, which most 90%, 99% of worries don't come true, you get a hit from that. So you start, your brain makes this unconscious connection between, oh, it didn't happen because I worried. Now, now we know that's consciously that that doesn't make sense, but unconsciously where our, our programming is, it does make sense. So we do actually get a hit out of worrying. Absolutely. So it becomes an addiction. I believe that, that worrying, anxiety is basically just OCD, but we use worries instead of like repetitive movements. Yeah. Oh, this is wonderful. I, I would just type in comments. I, I could go on for another five hours talking about this because this is a passion of mine, but we can't. So just to repeat, I want people to walk away with your ABCs. Can you repeat your ABCs? Yeah, then sure. what I'd like for you to do, Dr. Kennedy, is tell people where they can find you. And then I know you have a special gift for our audience today. Yeah. So basically what I, well, one of the, one of the things that I like to tell everybody is to really ask yourself, a number of times a day, am I safe in this moment? Like, am I safe in this moment? Because a lot of us who are stressed go from one stress to another, and we never really get on that island of going, you know what, at this moment, I'm safe. So just look around, look around your room right now. Are you safe right now? Like right now you're perfectly safe. And just let that sink in for a second that you are actually perfectly safe right now. Because so often we just live in this milieu of like, I'm not safe, I'm not safe. So when you actually draw a conscious awareness 
And this works great in the middle of the night. Like if you wake up in the middle of the night and you're in a panic, say, I know I'm panicked right now, but am I really safe in this moment? And you'll realize that you are. And then you can kind of go, okay, rather than let it spiral out of control on you. So ABC stands for awareness, body, and compassion. So when you're aware that you, when you see that you're angry or you're anxious or you're, you know, upset about something, just become aware. It's like, okay, I'm aware that this is happening. And then go into your body. So feel your breath, breathe into that area. If you can find that place of alarm in you, that's really, that really flares up when you're scared, your hand over that place, you know, rub your hands together, uh, rub your fingertips together, bring yourself into the sensation of the moment. So that's B. So the first is aware, like I'm freaking out about something. B is going, okay, I got to go into my body. And then C is connect with yourself, have compassion for yourself. And really sort of embrace, you know, I'm having this, you know, I'm having a freak out right now. And I love that, you know, I'm really angry at my husband right now. And I love that, you know, because it changes your physiology. And when it changes your physiology, you're able to get out of survival brain back in a rational brain. And then you can see things, then you can work through them, but you can't work through things when you've got OJ Simpson brain. Like if you're, if you're freaked out, you cannot think because your thoughts are poisoned. So that's ABCs. I do have a, a meditation on my website. My website is um, drrust.com, dr-russ.com. And my website has a free meditation right now that you can download uh, that sort of supports your immune system. And it kind of just supports your relaxation. It has binaural beats in it. It's got the latest in kind of like neuroscience as well as ancient, you know, ancient wisdom. So to find me, basically, you just have to Google the anxiety MD. All my stuff comes up with that. When is your book set uh, to come out? Because we already have my, our audience right now saying they want to have you back again. Sure. I'm, I'm writing the last section of it now. It's kind of written eat, pray, love style. 36 chapters on the thinking part, 36 chapters on the feeling part of anxiety, and then 36 chapters on how you connect the mind and the body. So it's you know, it should be published at the very latest by September the 15th. Well, it's fantastic and powerful. And I hope that one day you'll make a documentary on it because I know that it has served our audience. And I know that even though I am myself a completely healthy person and I practice a lot of things that we discussed today, but I'm sitting here and making notes or some of the things that you said, I'm like, I'm going to quote that going forward. So I geek out on things like this. So yeah. thank you so much, Dr. Kennedy, for taking your time being with us because to watch somebody leaving allopathic medicine for the sake of the people that you want to serve for the sake of you being true to yourself is a huge step because you had to recreate yourself. You had to recreate uh, yourself based on the truth that you discovered. And that means a lot to our audience because they work with a lot of medical doctors who are stuck and wanting to help people, but not known how to. So for those of you who joined us, Thank you so much for hanging out with us for almost an hour and a half. There's so much information. And I know I personally would have loved to have kept Russell here for another hour or two, but we must let you go and do like keep, keep telling, uh, telling me how many of you want to have him back, but do check out his website. So it is very simple to find the anxietymd.com. He has resources there. Sign up for his email list. So when the book is uh, going to go on pre-sale, you can pre-order it. I know I want my copy and I want it signed. So sure. even if I have to fly to Canada, Canada by then. But sure. thank you so much, Dr. Kennedy, for being there uh, here. It's a topic that we must discuss more and more and louder and louder because allopathic medicine, as we know, it does not do what it's supposed to do for chronic conditions. And that's true, Elena. I, I agree with you on that. It's hard for me to kind of go against my brotherhood that way, but it is true. There is, there is no denying that as well. You'll have a fantastic rest of the day. Those of you who will hear us on the podcast, there will be links in the description as well. You can go to my website, 360impacthealth.com, where you'll find the video of this interview and the resources for Dr. Kennedy's stuff. You have your ABCs, go get connected to your body, follow through the steps, go and heal your child that wants to be heard, that wants to be healed. Uh, do it in small doses, but do it without any judgment. With that said, we're signing off. Have a good day. There you have it. I hope you enjoyed today's topic. If you did, make sure to subscribe to the Health Wizard podcast. And please don't forget to tell others about it. If you would like to get more information about me and what I do, how I help amazing human beings just like you to achieve their dream health, go to www. 360impacthealth.com. Go to the contact page and shoot me a note. 
Thank you so much for listening. I'll catch you on the next episode of the Health Wizard Podcast. This is your host, Yelena, wishing you optimal natural health.